Well, this is really encouraging. I think this is um, just us gathering together is evidence that God is doing something, right? The fact that black and white and that we are taking time, that it matters that much and that we're trying to figure it out as best as we can. Uh, we're trying to navigate through this challenging season and we're trying to come together and call on the Lord and say, Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? First, um, you know, this was, this has been a challenging season, obviously. I think the one thing and, and, uh, what I've been asking the Lord is just to elevate my heart. Lord, give me your eyes, um, that I would see the situation from your perspective. And I think we can't look at it just from what's going on now with the George Floyd, but we have to look at it over the last season. This is, this has been um, unprecedented season. And I would even go further than that because I've heard that said before during different seasons, but we're in a season of biblical proportion. I don't think in my lifetime, and I'm not um, that old, but uh, I know that I've never seen a season like this before. Um, and that we have an opportunity though in this season. I think the exciting thing is that uh, Jesus said in the Gospels, he opened up the book and he said that this is being fulfilled in your midst. This is what the prophet Isaiah said. He would constantly go back to what was written and he would say, this is actually being fulfilled in our day. And I believe that we're in a season where we'll be able to say that these things that were prophesied are being fulfilled in our day. And so we're in a very unique generation to where we could actually say, Lord, when you said in Amos that you would, or in Haggai, that you would shake all nations, that literally we are seeing that fulfilled. I can't think of a time where all of the nations, where no, uh, um, there isn't one nation that has been left unshaken. One nation that has been unshaken. And so that we could be able to say that, Lord, in our generation, Lord, we saw you shake the nations, but that there's hope on the end of that because it says that I will shake all nations, but the desire, so that the desire of all nations would come. So my heart is excited because I believe that we're right on the edge of revival because his word says it. So in the midst of the shaking, on the back end of that, God's gonna bring forth the desire of the nations. And I think there's something about the shaking that he's awakened us to realize my heart over the last few weeks and really over the last season, there's been a fresh yearning for him to come and establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Because the things that we're talking about, they aren't gonna be, um, 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 there's only so much that, that man can do to bring forth their own justice. At the end of the day, there's only one king, there's only one governor, there's only one government that can reestablish peace on the earth true peace on, on the earth. And that King is Yeshua. And so um, I'm excited for that, even in the midst of the craziness of it all. Um, on the, the Ferguson piece, I have to tell you that when I saw it, um, as I'm sure everyone on this call did, my heart, uh, my heart was broken. And there's so much wrapped into that. You could spend hours just looking at the video and saying, what was that cop thinking to where he's on camera? So it's not like he wasn't on camera. So you think about the boldness of what took place. He's on camera and he's hearing people scream and that he knows that he's on camera, but yet he feels so empowered, so authoritarian that it doesn't matter. And that for eight minutes, nine minutes, he sits there with the knee on Floyd's neck. And what really got me was last, um, I think it was last night, I heard something, and I'd heard it before, but it just really hit home for me, was that um, he's crying out for his mother. So in the midst of this going on, he's crying out for his mother. He says, mother, help me. And if you know a man, <laughs> for him to cry out for his mother, it means that there's a lot that's going on. And he just wants something, someone to come and make things right, make the wrong thing right. And, and, and I was watching, the, watching the, the news the other day and um, I thought that his mother was still alive, but his mother is dead. 
his mother's dead, but yet his reflex is as he's as he's getting the air snuffed out of him. He says, "Mom, help me." And I think about as a black young man and my relationship with my mother, and uh, thinking about coming to a point where um, where that's that's the cry. And so we have to begin to ask God, Lord, what are you saying and what are you doing? And not only this, but just the shaking of the nations. And, um, and so in a sense, in seasons like this, these are, there's, I'm, 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 a, I'm a silver lining person. And so I always look for, Lord, what are you doing, God? Because I know that there's something positive out of this because i know that you work all things for good and so what are you saying to me what are you saying to the church god what do you what do you want us to get out of this god because um because you do nothing without revealing yourself to the prophets and so what are you what are you really saying um and i'm going to share a little bit about what the what the lord what i feel like the lord has said through that um I believe that he's trying to grow up his church. Lord says in the word that judgment comes first to the church and judgment isn't a bad thing always, but it's just God, um, 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 God removing everything that's hindering love. And so I believe that the Lord is trying to refine his bride. The Lord is trying to get his bride ready. The Lord is trying to get us to have kingdom mentalities and to not see things as the world sees them. And that's what's tough through this is because we can respond in a certain way instead of responding in the way of the kingdom. And so asking Lord, how does, what is a kingdom response? I don't wanna respond just like the world responds, but what's a kingdom response? How do we respond the way you would respond? And the Lord began to speak about, we're called to release a ministry of reconciliation. It says that we are ambassadors of a ministry of reconciliation. So we have to ask ourselves, Lord, are we operating in that ministry of reconciliation right now? And then I heard the Lord say, he said, we have to learn how to mourn. I think this is where the tension's been on the whites and blacks is that we don't know how to mourn right? We don't know as a white person, we don't know how to mourn for blacks because we don't understand it. We can try to, but we can't. And as blacks, we can't necessarily mourn. And even as Falu said, that as someone that's, that is coming from, from Africa and Nigeria, that it's hard for him to relate as Floyd did, or as a African American that is grown up in this type of society. And so we have to ask ourselves, Lord, how do we mourn? Because your word says, um, as your word says in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So we have to learn how to mourn with those who mourn. And there's two sides of that mourning. And um, I just heard the Lord say that, it, that, that it's time for us to be okay with sitting in the awkwardness of unfamiliarity. And it's okay to sit there and not know, right? Not to, not to have it all figured out, not to feel like I have to understand because guess what? We can't, right? If you're a white American, then you can't understand what it feels like to be a black male. You can't, right? You can't um, relate to my mother um, who says that every time that me and my brother are out, she has this angst of wondering that if we do get pulled over, what could possibly happen? And guess what? We don't need to necessarily understand it. We need to sit in that and learn how to mourn, learn how to get the Lord's heart for it and just say, I'm going to, I'm going to mourn with you. Even though I don't understand it, I'm going to learn how to mourn with you. And we're going to learn how to rejoice together. And, and why this is important, because in the Beatitudes, it says that blessed are those who mourn so that we can be comforted. And I believe that there's something about us learning how to mourn so that the Lord can bring forth the comforting to as well. And we got to be able to sit in this awkwardness and just allow the Lord just to get the Lord's heart. And, and that that's really the call, right? Um, in Revelations, it says that we're called to be a kingdom and a priest. 
And so part of a priest is being able to step in the intercession, which fills the heart of God for a situation. And so that we would ask the Lord, God, give me your heart. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about this? Not only, not Bronston's feelings about it, but Lord, what are your feelings about what's going on in the nation? Lord, I want your heart. I want to feel the way that you feel so that we can begin to truly intercede in that. And so asking the Lord, Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? And I think we don't have to, you know, I think it first starts with asking the Lord um, because what I love about Jesus is, is that, he, that he leads by example and that the Lord more than anyone else learned how to mourn with those who mourn. And it actually says in Isaiah 53, it says a man of sorrows and acquainted with our grief that he came as a man of sorrows, that he came to be able to, to, to mourn with us, right? He came to be able to come and experience grief and sorrow. That's one of the reasons why he put on flesh. And then it says in Hebrews 4.15, it says, we have a high priest who is able to empathize with our weakness. And just as I was thinking about that, the Lord reminded me of the verse that we love where it says that Jesus wept. And a lot of times we think that Jesus wept. It's in, um, it's in John 11, 33 through 34, but it says that Jesus wept. And a lot of times we think that Jesus wept because of Lazarus. But actually Jesus wept because Mary, his friend, was mourning. I'll read it. It says that um, when Jesus saw her, Mary weeping, and the Jews who came along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then it says Jesus wept. And so Jesus wept because he saw others weeping. Jesus was moved because he saw others hurting. We don't have to understand it, but we have to be able to get the heart of God Think about this. Jesus knew that he was going to bring back Lazarus. That's what he told the disciples. He said, don't worry. We're going to actually take a little bit of time because Lazarus is sleeping. He's not dead. So why did he weep? He didn't weep because Lazarus was dead. He wept because he was mourning because they were mourning and he connected with this, their, their, their heart and in intimacy with Mary. He began to say, this is not okay. My heart's broken because of the pain that Mary is feeling. And so we got to first connect with God's heart. And then we see David who was, um, then we see, um, you know, the Lord reminded me of, um, even in Job, right? Job is going through a lot and Job, actually the Lord rebukes Job's friends because they don't represent God rightly in Job's plight why this is so important, right? That we begin to mourn the way and to represent God rightly in these discussions because we're representing God, right? The reason why Job, reason why God was upset with Job's friends was because not that they didn't have a desire to comfort, but it's because in that they didn't represent God rightly. And so we got to ask ourselves, Lord, how do we as Christians represent your heart in this situation, not the way that the world does it. But Lord, how do we represent your heart? God, what's our voice? I was just asking the Lord today, Lord, what's the, what's the church's voice in this hour? Because I feel like it's silent. Lord, what is the church saying, Lord? What is the church releasing into the atmosphere? And so we have to begin to ask the, uh, ask the Lord, Lord, how do we mourn the way that you mourn? And that's not something that comes other than us asking the Lord, right? That comes by the spirit. So we got to ask the spirit, Lord, teach us how to mourn, teach us how to connect with those that are mourning, even if we don't understand it, God. Help us connect, teach us how to pray for that. Teach us how to enter into true intercession for that. And then the next side of that coin with mourning was the Lord um, just kind of revealed is that we got to learn how to mourn for our enemies. We got to learn how to mourn for those that persecute us as well. So it's not only us learning how to mourn with those that mourn, but it's mourning with those who have persecuted us, right? That's again, going back to the Beatitudes, it says, 
Blessed are those that receive persecution, for they will receive the kingdom. What a great reward if we respond rightly to the persecution. Racism is a form of persecution. And so if we respond rightly, we can actually, I believe, bring forth the kingdom. We have opportunity to push forth the kingdom if we respond rightly, but it comes from us responding with the way that Jesus responded. And again, our solution and our image of how it's supposed to be done is found first in Jesus. And we see that even on the cross, Jesus said as they were persecuting him, to imagine the words coming forth from his mouth, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's part of it, right? It's me trying to rationalize, like I said, with that guy that has his, has his knee on Floyd's neck for nine minutes. And here's this guy in his lowliest moment calling out for his mother. And everything in me wants to be angry. Everything in me wants to call forth wrath but can i take on the heart of jesus where i'm praying for my enemies where i'm mourning for my enemies as jesus did with those that were ridiculing him as he said father forgive them and the powerful thing is the forgive them but it's also the fact that he said for they know not what they do I believe that there's something in that man's psyche where he did not fully know what he was doing. That he was controlled by the evil one, maybe. I don't know what it was. But can I enter into a place of intercession, take it on the heart of God, where I begin to pray for his salvation? Where I begin to pray for white America that still sees color? White America that is, um, yeah all of those things, can we begin to pray for the Lord to bring forth salvation for those people, for the Lord to begin to give them his heart? I love David was called a man after God's own heart, and we see David do the exact same thing where with Saul, as Saul is pursuing him, Saul's his enemy, but yet it says that David and his man wept when Saul died that even called Saul his anointed one, the Lord's anointed one. This is the one that was trying to kill David, but yet David, a man after God's own heart, prays and he weeps. Him and his man put on sackcloth as they're asking for the Lord, as they're crying out for Saul. And so again, right, this, this comes from the Lord. This isn't something that we can conjure up on our own. This is Christ in us coming forth. This is us asking for the Lord to give us his heart. It says in 1 Samuel 2.35, it says that he's going to raise up priests after his own heart and his mind. And that's what it really requires for us to really mourn the way that God's asking us to mourn. Mourn with those who mourn and then mourn for those who are persecuting us. And so the Lord just asking us, can we learn how to mourn by the Spirit? Can we mourn the way that can we mourn the way that the kingdom calls us to mourn? And then two other points, and then um, I'll close it, uh, close up. But the Lord just said, you know, uh, Randy mentioned this earlier, but I think it's so interesting that we are um, it, it's Pentecost week. And that uh, God's so intentional, right? This didn't. This could have happened three months ago, but it happened on Pentecost week. And I believe the Lord is saying it's Pentecost week because the only thing that's going to bring forth unity is the Spirit of the Living God. The only thing that's going to bring forth unity is when He pours out His Spirit on all flesh. It's the Spirit that brings. It says that. One spirit, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, baptize in one spirit as from one body, whether Jews or Gentiles. We could say whether black or white or Hispanic or African-American or from Africa directly or Chinese. What makes us one isn't that we march together. 
What makes us one in the kingdom is the spirit that he poured out on all flesh, that he's pouring out on all flesh. And so if we want to see unity, we need to begin to cry out for an outpouring of the spirit. We need to have another Pentecost. We need to ask that Lord would fulfill Joel, Lord, that you pour out your spirit on all flesh, God. Ephesians 4.1 says the unity in spirit through the bond of peace. How do we bring forth peace? We're crying out for peace. But the only way that we'll receive peace is through the spirit of the living God. And so that we would ask for another Pentecost in this Pentecost week and that we would really ask, Lord, could it be that this happened during Pentecost week because the Lord is wanting to release another Pentecost? That he wants us to to come together. Maybe our response as the church is to gather together and cry out again as they did on Pentecost. Get in a room and just cry out for the Lord to release his spirit on all flesh. Release your spirit on the races, God. Release your spirit on all flesh, God. Colossians 3.11 says, here there is no Gentile, Jews, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. And just asking that Christ would be all in all, that Christ would right the wrong. It's not gonna come from a president. It's not gonna come from a governor. It's gonna come from his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And then lastly, just felt the Lord saying and just reminding us that, um, because there's so much hope in this too as well. And I think that's the, j just that I felt like as, as I'm processing it and, and, as, um, and as there's tears as I'm processing it and, and, and I'm wrestling with these things, I felt the Lord remind me of um, the, um, the divine disruption or the divine dichotomy in God's dealings where things seem opposites, but yet they're both happening simultaneous. And in Joel, where it talks about the great and dreadful day of the Lord, right? It's not just the dreadful, but it's the great day of the Lord. In Isaiah 60, where it talks about a great darkness covering the earth, but yet at the same time, the glory of the Lord is filling the earth. The glory of the Lord is shining upon his people. And as we talk about Haggai, where it talks about the nations are shaking, but in the same breath, the Lord talks about the desire of the nations coming. And so in the midst of all this, I just got this great hope in my spirit because I feel like we're in the midst of this divine disruption, right? We're in the midst of this divine dichotomy of two things that seeming we could look and say, God, things are getting so much worse. But if we have the eyes of Christ, we can say, God, things are getting so much closer to your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. God, we're so much closer to this end time harvest. God, we're so much closer to the revival that, that we've been crying out for because we know that as it looks like it's getting darker, we also know and believe that the glory of the Lord is rising upon the church like it never has before and that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so my prayer is just that we would continue to, to see things from God's perspective. I've been asking the Lord, there's a prophet named Bob Hartley and he talks about the best view in town. So I've been asking the Lord, give me the best view in town. God, give me your vision, give me your view on things. And that I think we're in an hour where the Lord is wanting to speak to the church as it talks about in Revelations. Where, um, where it says that um, eyes to see and ears to hear what the Lord is saying to the church. And so I think we need to be praying for that. And that the Lord's really trying to put a longing in our hearts. I think it's beautiful that he's putting this longing in our heart for unity because I believe that he's putting a longing in our heart to see his physical kingdom coming to earth. Revelations 5, I will close in this. Revelations 5 is beautiful because it talks about that when this thing culminates, when it all said and done, I want to read it. It says that when worthy as the lamb is tied with, it says now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, 
each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which we know is the prayer of the saints, which is awesome. And they sang a new song saying, I believe that the Lord wants to give us a new song during this season. In the midst of this chaos, the Lord wants the church to begin a new song. And it's going to be this song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. There's no racism there, right? And have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. And so this is where things are headed. And um, I just believe that the Lord wants us to trust him and he wants to teach us kingdom realities, like how to mourn the way that he mourns and how to see things from his perspective. 